I can keep an eye on the waiting room if you like. And uh, that would but be well, great. Yeah, but welcome everybody that's here. I'm just really excited about this conversation today with two folks from Pennsylvania that for as long as I, I know have been leading the charge in K-12 OER and been at some very innovative uh, settings in Pennsylvania and also are doing work that uh, affects OER nationally. So I will hand it over to Dr. Rebecca Henderson <laughs> and Dr. Sam Mormondo to uh, set the stage. They'll introduce themselves and uh, have the conversation today. Um, are you recording? Yes. Okay. Yes, I am. Take it away, Becky. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Amy. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Just to let everyone know our agenda for today. What we're going to do is we're going to have some introductions here coming up in just a moment, and we're going to do a brief overview of Go Open National Network's vision, goals, and timeline. We're going to talk a lot about the work that's been going on in Garnet Valley School District in Glen Mills, Pennsylvania. So this is definitely going to be a PA-centric presentation today with my dear friend Sam here. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about the intersection of OER and artificial intelligence. And then, of course, at the end, we are going to go ahead and open this up for some Q&A from all of you. So let's go ahead and uh, jump in. And Sam, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Sam Ormando. I'm the Director of Technology Innovation and Online Learning at Garnet Valley and the founder of a nonprofit called Admative Learning, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the presentation, which gives us an opportunity to work outside of Pennsylvania, Becky, um, <laughs> but primarily we are Pennsylvania based and we work with a lot of schools and, and teachers in PA. Thanks, Sam. I know most of you on the call know me. I am Becky Henderson. I am currently the Student Services Administrator at the Westmoreland Intermediate Unit in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. I also serve as our Go Open Community Engagement Manager. And with us, as always, is Amy, our fearless leader. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Amy Evans Godwin, <laughs> Senior Advisor with ISCME and Lead Facilitator of the Go Open Network to work nationally to uh, elevate K-12 OER, and our work going forward especially is going to connect K-12 OER to other issues, and Gen AI is one of those that is, uh, you know, foremost in our minds, so really excited to have this conversation. Thanks, Amy. So those of you that have been with us before, I know you have seen this slide. We want to reiterate this all the time because we feel that this is so important, that the Go Open National Network is a community of educators and leaders who support K-12 open education through knowledge sharing and collaboration to benefit teaching and learning. We have been community-led since early 2022. Go Open started as a federal initiative about seven years ago under the Office of Ed Tech to help promote open education among member districts and states. Um, that's actually how Sam and I first met a long time ago. Um, and many states launched their own Go Open initiatives, and those have continued to go on with community-led oversight, and we're working to sustain and broaden that participation. The work that we've done since then has included the launch of our Go Open Hub, which is a centralized place for sharing on OER Commons, and we've shifted to membership to individuals so that anyone can join. So we really encourage you to go on to the Go Open Hub, which we'll make sure that everyone has the link to later on in the presentation. So you can check out the collections and the resources that we have there, including our collection of AI resources for everyone, because we really wanna make sure that you have the resources that we are coming in contact with all the time so that you can continue to do the good work that you're doing every day in your schools. We talk a lot about the benefits of OER for educators and for students, but really what this is, is that open is a tool of empowerment for all educators. And we want to build with equity in mind. We wanna make sure that we are breaking down those barriers for our students and for our educators so that when we look at what we're doing as a whole, we're looking at our systems here, we are making sure that we are looking at our curriculum, we're making sure that we're looking at our instruction, we make sure that there is a place for open in what we do in our practice every day. 
So with that, what we're going to do is we're going to actually turn it over to Sam and I am going to go ahead and Sam, I am going to spotlight you in our presentation and I want you to go ahead and take it away. Awesome. All right. Well, Becky, thank you so much for having me. And um, I want to set the context for the discussion around OER today. So we have a, pro a four step process or a four phase process in Garnet Valley. We call the course design process and OER is a major component of that. And it starts with EDI, which is effectively designed instruction. And it's a it's a really high level deep dive into instructional design and the importance of instructional design. And over the course of the last six or seven years, we've been able to train up all of our teachers um, on this practice. So now that all of our incoming teachers um, through our induction process go through this professional development as well. So that's phase one. So they get the understanding of you know, that 30,000 foot view of what, what is good course design in 2024 when everything is digital, right? When we have a course or courses that are up for a curriculum rewrite, or maybe we have a new course based on new standards or a course that our teachers wanna, wanna bring into our course catalog. We are a UBD school district. So we have the backwards design model for our curriculum writing. That is phase two for us. And then a big bulk of this work happens in, in phase three, which is OER, Open Educational Resources. And we spend a lot of time working with our teachers uh, on training and, and creative commons licensing and understanding the terminology and the legal side of things, but also how to go about creating and finding OER resources. And then the last part of this phase is digitization. It's when we have our teachers digitize the curriculum documents, the OER resources, the activities, and we put them in our LMS, our LMS of Schoology, because ultimately we want to have one course taught by the same teacher that can be taught in the face-to-face -face environment, an online synchronous or asynchronous environment, or a blended learning environment, which all of our high school courses are, are blended started, I um, think last year, year before we started that. So this, this has always been the goal for us and training teachers, you know, is a, is a little bit of a heavy lift now that, you know, substitutes are, are hard to come by. The curriculum writing hasn't changed a whole bunch. And, you know, I thank Becky and, and some of the colleagues that she had that, that came to Garner Valley many years ago to help us understand you know, how OER can fit into this process for us. And it really dramatically changed the way, you know, we started to do everything here at Garnet Valley. When we work with our teachers about OER, you know, the first thing that we, we have to get across to them is OER is not about free, right? It's not about finding free resources. OER is about personalization. And, you know, it was really difficult for us to have that conversation in the beginning because the teachers came in with to the training with a, with an understanding that OER meant free, and we worked you know many months and, and early on maybe even you know course of a whole year to to kind of get teachers to understand the power of of open education resources that they can really be used to personalize the learning experience for our students. So it was a real game changer when when we added this to our, our course design process. Now, the trouble with that is, it's like, how do you get that, right? Like, how do you personalize the learning experience for all students? You know, we have 20 to 25 students, um, maybe 30 students in our classroom, and it's really difficult. Some students may not be engaged into, in, in the content area. Um, some students may um, have a different um, a, a reading level for example, have an IEP um, um, that, that states that they need certain accommodations or modifications. Um, some students may speak a different language, right? So it's really hard to personalize the learning experience for students, even though that's our goal, that's every teacher's goal since, you know, since education has been around is to really deliver that high quality individualized instruction. But it was really, really difficult. E even, even today, it's, it's hard, right? But with AI, I think for the first time in my career, it's it's really possible to do that. So a little bit about me, I introduced myself earlier. You know, I work at Garnet Valley. This is my 10th or 11th year in the district. Um, and this process has evolved for us, right? 
it, it, it's not perfect today. It never was. It was never meant to be perfect. It's always meant to be, uh, it's always meant to evolve and change with, with, you know, new tools and technologies and, and teaching practices and the standards change and things like that. So we do this work at Garnet Valley every single day. I mentioned uh, quickly the nonprofit Innovative Learning. So we were um, really focused on online and blended learning prior to the pandemic. And some of our neighboring districts wanted to partner and just, you know, we're giving kudos to Pennsylvania for being a leader with OER, but Pennsylvania sometimes isn't innovative as a state, right? And it really, they didn't give us an opportunity for myself or my colleagues here to work with our neighboring districts um, after school, right? Or over the summer, there just wasn't a mechanism for, for, you know, my colleagues to be compensated. So we started a nonprofit to get around that. And that's, that's kind of how innovative learning came to be. And, you know, obviously through the pandemic, we, we supported schools and, and teachers with online and blended learning. And then obviously with AI, do, been doing a lot of work with, with AI. And you can see on the screen, um, just different workshops and, and keynote speeches and, and different things with that. So um, doing a lot of work around AI. I'm gonna go back to the previous slide there, uh, Becky, but, um, so I graduated from Wine University, my doctorate degree, I was, I uh, defended my dissertation in the fall of 2022. And I can't prove this, but I may have been the last person to defend a dissertation prior to AI, right? And I don't say that as like, like an award, I, I'm not proud of that. Like I know if I had AI tools writing my dissertation, it would have been so much better than it was. And so I'm, I'm so happy that, that people today have those tools. And, and it's, I feel that it's my responsibility to help, you know, students and, and adult learners leverage those tools to make themselves more efficient and effective at what they do. Because of the work that we've been done, you can see on the screen, we, we got some awards. We, we ended up publishing a book about our EDI training with our teachers on online and blended learning. And then we were looking for support and, and some resources about um, AI last year, maybe even the year before that. And we really couldn't find anything that was geared towards K-12. Certainly not OER wasn't, wasn't mentioned in AI at that time. So we just wrote a book and we just really um, documented our journey as a school district through the ups and the downs and, and what worked for us and what didn't work and some of the concerns we have and still have um, related, related to that. So I wanna talk about how we go about using um, OER in our district, how we go about training our teachers. We call it the three C's of OER. It's collect, curate, and create. So the collect phase is we gather all of our teachers who are teaching that same class or same course, and we put them in a room and we lock the door and we say, bring all of the resources that you use to teach your class and let's lay them out on the table and let's have all of your colleagues who teach that same course, look at those resources and let's pick the best resources. And the first time we did this, I was, I was shocked. Teachers who shared a hallway for 20 years and taught the same class for, for, for two decades had no idea what their colleagues were using in terms of resources to teach that same class, right? So I was, I was shocked. And that has been a game changer for us, is just getting teachers in the same room at the same time, talking about the resources that they use. So once that phase is, is finished, there's going to be gaps in the curriculum, right? There's, there's going to be gaps in, we don't have a resource to use to teach this concept or to meet this objective. So then we have our teachers go out and we, we have them curate resources. Now that could mean going through various OER repositories, going onto YouTube or Khan Academy and looking for educational videos or instructional videos to use in their course. And, and that fills in the gaps for the most part. But there's going to be even more gaps in the curriculum because again, those resources probably aren't personalized to the students sitting in front of them. They may be good enough to use and, and, and to put into the LMS, but they may, may not be as personalized as, as we had hoped. So then we get to the last phase and that's the create. And that's where we have our teachers go through training, obviously to do this, but to create resources 
that can be personalized to the students that are sitting in front of them, right? Now think about what that means, right? That means you're, you're building from scratch oftentimes, you know, graphic organizers and interactive activities and images and slide decks and instructional videos. They take a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of training to get it right because you don't want to, you just don't want to put a resource in front of a student that's not professionally done just because it's OER doesn't mean it doesn't mean it's, it's visually appealing or it makes sense or, um, you know, it's accessible, right? So we wanted to really focus on the create phase. And the more we did, the more we realized that that was like the bottleneck for us. It was taking so much time and so much training and so many other resources outside of this process. Think about the cameras to, to film the instructional videos and, this, and writing the scripts for the instructional videos and the editing, which takes hours on top of hours and then uploading to, to the LMS or YouTube and linking. So it just, it just took so long that it was kind of hindering our process. So I wanna talk about the, the evolution of this before I dive into like the tools and the changes that, that AI has brought for us. So as you can see on, on the screen, hopefully, is I'll focus on the time first so without OER, that's us buying a textbook. This is, this is pre-Becky coming to Gardner Valley, right, in 2016 or whatever it was. It took us about two years to get a course up and running. By the time we wrote the curriculum, by the time we digitized the resources, um, by the time we vetted the textbook, right, it took about two years. Once we went towards, uh, once we went to OER, we added another year to that. Right. Because, again, it took so much time to get teachers in the same room collecting what they were using and then filling in the gaps with curated resources and then ultimately creating their own personalized resources. So we ended up adding a year. And in the beginning, we were fine with that because we were only doing maybe one or two courses a year. But then we had to scale this. Right. We're a school district. We have five schools. We have five thousand students. And we have a number of teachers that that we were up for curriculum rewrites and we had to scale this. And we knew that three years was just too long, but we didn't have an answer until AI. So with AI and OER, our process is not only back to where it was, it's half of that. Right. So we can get a course started in this process in September. And we can have it go through the curriculum writing process, the OER process, the digitization process within one year. And we can start at the following September. So that's a game changer for us. Looking at the right side, talk about the, the cost reallocation or savings in, so, in some cases. Now, again, OER for us was not about money. It was about personalization. But you can see, without OER, our average course to create was a was over twenty one thousand dollars. I don't I don't have to pull the participants here today. You know where all that money went, right? It went to the textbook publishers. So we were buying textbooks written for sometimes other states, right, or other students, not in our school district, and we were buying those at you know about five hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, you know that was crushing our our curriculum budget, and when we surveyed our teachers, they're like, I don't really don't even use the textbook, say for maybe a chapter or two, or just use it for like the scope and sequence. So we were spending all of this money and we weren't using the resources and the resources weren't aligned to our beliefs or our students, right? So we had an issue. So moving to OER, you can see we were able to do this process over the course of three years and we were able to take a large portion of that textbook money and reallocate it back to our teachers. So it was win-win for, for everybody. So our teachers were able to put a little bit extra money in their pocket for the work that they were doing. And ultimately, they were creating better courses because they were able to use personalized resources for the students that they knew were in their classrooms, right? But we hit some bottleneck with that. And it just took us too long. And our teachers, you know, they're teaching full-time, right? They have full-time jobs. And they didn't want to spend 
three years in the curriculum writing process, right? They, they have families and they have other interests outside of school. So we were having a difficult time finding teachers to take on this work. To the credit of, of our educators here, like we never had a gap in this. Like we always found people to do it, but, but it wasn't easy because it was, it was difficult work, right? And, and time consuming work. With AI, we're able to drop that down. That process is so much more efficient and effective at creating those personalized resources that now we have teachers wanting to do this without us really having to beg them to do it. And then, yes, it is cheaper for us because we don't have as much time invested in the training or we're paying the teachers to do this over a course of three years. So we're able to save this money, but it's not saving because we're reallocating. We're doing more courses. We're able to rewrite and revise courses at a pace that we were never able to do before. So the overall budget hasn't changed probably. It's just where the money's going has changed dramatically for us. And that's been a game changer. So, you know, I talked a little bit earlier uh, I think before we, we started hitting record um, to Aunt Becky. So I want you to walk away with an understanding of, of how we do this, right? Some tools. And I wanted to showcase some of the tools that I use every day and my teachers use here at Garnet Valley. Um, and I purposely chose to use free tools because I know districts don't necessarily have budget room or licenses for all these other. Now, some of these tools I'm going to showcase do have a paid version, but in my opinion, the free version is, is very, very good. So I want to point out this video I'm going to play you is not me, right? This is my digital twin. I created it on a site called HeyGen. There's other sites out there that allow you to do this. Essentially, I recorded myself on a green screen, 30 second video, uploaded it to this website, and it enables me to create instructional videos like this in a matter of minutes versus what it would have taken me before. We're just scratching the surface with this. My teachers don't have, you know, district-wide accounts to do this. Um, we'll see where that goes. But for right now, we're learning the, the AI side of this, just, just to make sure it's safe, it's secure, it's, it's productive, it's efficient. Um, but I can definitely see the benefit, and I think you will as well. So even though this looks like me, it sounds like me, I did not create this video um, I mean, I created it, but it, I didn't have to sit and film and get camera and the angles and the lighting. And I didn't have to do any of that. Right. So the first version of this is an instructional video of me talking about AI. AI offers powerful tools that can enhance learning, personalize educational experiences and develop critical thinking skills. However, with these opportunities come responsibilities. Students must understand the ethical implications of AI including privacy concerns, data security, and potential bias embedded in AI systems. All right, so, so that was me, and it's like a two minute clip, I'm not gonna play the whole thing, of me doing that video in English. And you can see it's not perfect, right? My hands are probably too big in, in the video and my head's moving around, but we're two years in with AI, it's only gonna get better, right? But here's the power, in my opinion. So. That video took seven minutes to create. The next video took maybe 30 seconds after I finished the first. And it's me speaking in Spanish. And I don't speak Spanish. But think about this for, for a classroom that or an EL teacher, right, that has to create these, these instructional videos to meet the needs of the students in, in front of them. Like, to me, it's mind-boggling that AI enables us to do this, right? So I'll hit play real quick. La IA ofrece herramientas poderosas que pueden mejorar el aprendizaje, personalizar las experiencias educativas y desarrollar habilidades de pensamiento crítico. Sin embargo, estas oportunidades conllevan responsabilidad. Right. So again, I don't speak Spanish, right? But you can imagine, like, we have students in our classrooms who, who don't speak English as their first language. So how are we differentiating for them? How are we meeting their needs? Without something like AI, it would take our teachers weeks, months, maybe, maybe not even be able to do it to this level. We can do it with AI in a matter of minutes, if, if not less, right? So I was like, what's the 
what's the capacity of this? So I looked at our student information system and I just like looked at who was registering. And I said, I looked up, I, I filtered by, by home language and we had a family register like the day before school from Poland. And obviously they speak Polish. I'm like, all right, let me see if, if AI can do this. AI oferuje potężne narzędzia, które mogą ulepszyć naukę, spersonalizować doświadczenia edukacyjne i rozwinąć umiejętności krytycznego myślenia. Jednak wraz z tymi możliwościami. All right. I don't speak Polish either, right? Like I can just I, I obviously I'm working with our EL teachers and I'm like, guys, we we have to dive into this. Like you're spending all this time trying to create resources and, and go into Google Translate and, and doing different things. Like there's an easier way to do this. So let's let's leverage AI. Let's make sure, you know, again, we're using it the right way and ethically and, and safe. And but you can see just with this quick demo, and and I'm no, you know, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in this stuff, but you know, I, I do it all the time and I, and I see the benefits of of this one example, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna demo a couple others and I just I just want to show you some of the things that we're we're just you know dipping our toes in now at Garnet Valley. Some of this we're, we've been doing, but some of it's new, right? So I'm going to demo. Let me see if I can get my videos out of the way here. So many of the people on this call may have, they may know um, Diffit. They may know some of these, right? So let me see here. Sorry, I'm screwing. I got too many windows open. I apologize. Let's delete that. Let's move this over here. All right, I think that looks better. All right, so if you're not familiar with Diffit, this is, this is something, there's a free version, which in my opinion is amazing. The paid version allows you to um, export in different formats and things like that, but the free version in my opinion is awesome. So this is one of those, this is an AI site that allows our teachers to create resources um, and, and be able to differentiate, differentiate those resources at a level that, that's not possible with, without AI, right? So real quick, um, the, the website is diffit.me and you can see there's a lot of things that you can do and I won't have time to go over all of them obviously, but it's a, you know, you can align these resources, the standards. And I think the best way to show you this is just to demo it. So I'm going to pick ELA because that's the first one. And I'll just pick the first standard. So I, it already knows I'm in Pennsylvania. I can pick any grade level. I'll pick 10th grade. I'll pick the first standard just to save time. And then I'll type in a topic or a question or a theme. And I'm just going to do animal farm. I'm, this is not the best way to prompt AI, obviously, but I'm going to just just do it for, for the purposes of, of today. So it's, you can see the green bar, it's thinking, right? It's, it's figuring out um, what it's gonna create for me. And I don't know, how, how long was that? 10 seconds? It gives me a, a, an image that I can put, it was like a, a banner on my LMS perhaps. You know, if I, I can just pick one, I'll just pick this one. Um, it gives me adapted reading passage on, like a summary of what the Animal Farm book is. It gives me bullet point summaries. It gives me key vocabulary terms. It gives me mobile choice questions, short answer questions, open-ended prompts, right? Like in 10 seconds, if I'm teaching students about the, you know, the book Animal Farm and I already don't have OER resources, like this is an easy one for me. Here's the crazy part with, with AI. I can hit this button up here and I can translate, I can, I can translate this into, we'll use Spanish again, and it changes everything on that page that I just showed you into Spanish. Well, it doesn't change the, the book title, obviously, but you can see here, it changes it into Spanish. And our world language teachers, you know, especially Spanish one, Spanish two, like they're getting students that, speak Spanish at a, at a pretty good level. And then other students who are taking Spanish for the first time. They, they have to differentiate their sources, their resources. So that's easy. They can just change the grade level to say seventh grade and regenerate. And it regenerates the text based on that reading level. So 
our teachers are using this all the time to differentiate the reading level, right? It's still in Spanish. I'm going to translate it back to English to show you some other features. One of the things I like about Diffit and one of the knocks on AI is we don't know where you're getting the source from, right? It's pulling from all this training data. And that's a, that's a valid concern. With Diffit, you can click the button here that says show sources and it will show you where it got the information. Well, maybe you don't want Wikipedia to be a source. Well, you can, you can change that, right? I can edit this. I can make it shorter, shorter, I can make it longer, and I can edit the sources to where I can say, I don't want Wikipedia as, as one of my sources to generate this information from. And I can add other sources. So teachers have full control, and again, that's the free version, right? Teachers have full control over what this site does for them. If Again, if you're unfamiliar with Diffit, this is only scratching the surface because the power in Diffit, in my opinion, is creating student activities. So we put information in, we're at a seventh grade reading level on the book, The Animal Farm. So I'm gonna hit create resources. So it gives me a, a number of options. What, like what's the, what's the objective of this lesson? Is it to summarize the learning? Is it to teach vocabulary, reading strategies, writing strategies, critical thinking skills? Like what, what's the overarching like skill that I want to have my students walk away with? And we'll just, we'll do writing strategies, right? Just for an example. And I have so many opportunities here, so many templates that I can pick from that, you know, and there's seven more, you know, that I can, I can choose to create. So I'm just going to do this, you know, read and take notes, right? So this is a template, read and take notes based on the information that I put in to diff it. Like to me, that's a game changer. It happens very, very quickly. You can differentiate um, language. You can differentiate reading levels. You can do a whole host of things. You can export this to Google Slides, PowerPoint, PDF. It's amazing. Um, so we use this full-time in Garnet Valley. This is a big part of our OER process when we're um, designing our courses. The next um, AI tool I wanna, I wanna showcase is a new one, at least new for me. It's from Google. It's called Notebook LM. And I just heard about this last week and I can't get enough of it because I'm always looking for a, a way or a tool to add something new to our courses without adding more work to our teacher's plates. So what this does is allow you to upload sources you can upload a PDF, you can upload a YouTube video, a link, you can upload a link to a, a blog post or, or an online article. You can copy and paste text. That, that's how you add sources to, Google, uh, to Notebook LM. Once you add, and you have 50 different sources in one notebook, and you have unlimited notebooks at this point. By the way, this is free. So I wanted to test its limitations. So I, I mentioned that myself and my colleagues wrote a book navigating the AI revolution in our schools. So I uploaded this entire PDF of our book, 250 some pages, just to see if it would take it. And it did. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool, right? So then if I go to this guide, I can, I can create FAQs. I can create a study guide of this book, right? Talk about powerful. Table of contents if I needed one. A briefing document, which is like a summary. And I was like, I stopped there and I was super impressed. But then I saw this button over here that has audio overview and I, and I didn't know what it was. So I, I just hit play. Notebook LM created a nine minute and 30, or nine minute, 31 second podcast of my book using AI. And it is accurate and it is believable. So I'm going to play just 30 seconds or a minute, and you judge for yourself if you think this is believable as a podcast. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another deep dive. This time we're diving headfirst into a topic that's been absolutely everywhere lately, AI and education. You've all sent in a ton of interesting stuff from book chapters, some really recent research, and we're here to help you cut through the noise and figure out what it all really means. 
it's definitely one of those things that's both exciting and maybe a little bit, you know, anxiety inducing at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with all the talk about AI being this huge disruptive force. Right. Like that excerpt you shared where they compare AI to tsunami hitting schools. Yes. From navigating the AI revolution in our schools, it's a powerful image. And honestly, looking at all this material, I can see why they went with a tsunami metaphor. All right. So blew my mind, obviously. So I'm like, all right, great. How can this be used in the classroom? So back to our animal farm example, right? So before we, I jumped on this call, I took that same example. I uploaded a couple Wikipedia links just to get the background of Animal Farm into the system. I copied a summary of Animal Farm, pasted it into the system. I said, give me some uh, quiz questions I can use as a teacher. And you can see them there on your screen. All accurate, I went through them. They're, they're awesome. Quiz questions, um, you know, glossary terms. I said, give me some FAQs. And then I went back to the podcast idea and it created an eight minute and 20 second podcast on the animal farm. All right, so get ready because today we're diving deep into a book you chose for us, Animal Farm by George Orwell. Classic. It is. And on the surface, it seems like a simple story about, well, talking animals. I mean, Orwell even called it a fairy story. Political commentary. We get these pigs, horses, chickens, all acting out this very human drama. It's satire at its finest, using humor and exaggeration to show the hypocrisy of the Soviet regime. So how do- So it's accurate and it happens within five minutes. So what I'm working with my teachers on is taking this recording, you can download it. You can change the speed of the, of the conversation. You download this to a, a audio file. We upload it right to our LMS and it becomes like an introduction to that unit or that module. And our students don't have access to this yet because we're, you know, we're making sure it's secure and things like that. But once, you know, if we decide to give our students access, it's just one more way that they can access their learning. You know, maybe, maybe they leave school and, you know, the concept is just over their head and, and they didn't understand what the teacher was, was talking about in class. They can put their notes into Notebook LM, create this simple little podcast, and now it's explained to them in a way that makes sense to them, potentially. Now there's a way that they can get a quick summary of, of the notes. So again, this is new for me. I, uh, it's probably new for a lot of people on, on this call as well. I, I think Google's just scratching the surface with this, but I, I, I can definitely see it, it being useful in the work that I do and the work that, that many people here probably do as well. I can do... Becky, I can do as many of these as you want. I have one more I'll show and then we'll, I can cut out and take some questions or I can continue to show other free tools. This other one, again, it's new for me. It's called napkin.ai. I don't know where they get these names at, but napkin AI, it does something different that other AIs can't do, in my opinion. So oh, go back and we'll go animal farm here. Again, this is not the best way to prompt the AI. That's another, another course, another day, but I'll hit generate using AI and it's generating what they call a napkin. It's like a Google doc, right? And you're like, okay, well, I, I've seen AI do this a million times. I'm like, yes, you have. What you probably haven't seen is this little lightning bolt. So at any paragraph on this document, this napkin, I can click the lightning bolt and it creates an infographic of that particular concept or that paragraph, right? So it's it's AI in, right? It's thinking. And then it's going to give me an infographic that I can either copy and paste, I can download, I can change this, I can edit this. So I don't love this freedom or control, equality versus tyranny. I don't love that. So I'm going to change it. Now I have like a little, little timeline. Well, I don't love that one either. And maybe I'm going to pick a different one. Like it happens in seconds. I can change the font. I can change the color. I can download this into it into an image. I can save this whole document and save it and give it to kids as notes. Right? I can change. You know, I can add multiple of these to to my workflow. Right? Corruption and power. And 
I haven't seen another AI to do this, certainly not a free one. Um, mind blowing. My job is to try to make AI more manageable for our teachers. So I'm not adding work to their plates. I'm trying to take work off of their plates. And by using things like Diffit, by using things like um, Notebook LM, by using Napkin, or I'll show you one more. I'm looking at the clock now. Like this, this Google extension here called Alana, it's free, right? It helps create Google Slides, right? Now I know all of our teachers can create Google Slides, but do they have the time to create Google Slides, right? Um, it's, it's time consuming, right? So again, I'm just gonna pick Animal Farm, not the best way to do this. I'm not gonna have a prompt necessarily. I'm gonna pick five slides. I'm gonna pick 10th grade reading level and I'm not gonna add any attachments. And again, it's the free version. You can see over here, you get three a day or 10 in a week. I don't know what the upgraded version is because I don't have it. Um, uh, gather prompt. So please create me slides for the novel animal farm. I get to pick the theme and it's going to create five slides. I could have picked 10. I could have picked 20. I, I don't know if there's even a limit, to be honest with you, um, that I can use as a starter to, to begin a slide presentation on the background of, of the novel Animal Farm. Now, what would I do with this? I can maybe, you know, spend some more time and make it, you know, a little bit more professional and present it to the class a as an introduction to the novel. I can use it and just maybe put it in the LMS as, as some notes, right, for students to, to go back and, and they need some remediation or um, some reteaching. I can have some PowerPoint notes there. I can, I can add audio and annotate over these just, just so they hear my voice. So there's so many things you can do, um, but all those things take time. So if AI can take some of that work off of our teacher's plates, then I'm, I'm a big fan of this. So here you go. So are these perfect? Probably not, but in 25 seconds, it created a basic PowerPoint that I think, or a Google slide that I think could probably be a great starting point for teachers. So, Becky, that was uh, you. Yes. a lot of what I, I wanted to show. <laughs> that was a lot, but but it was good stuff. And, and I want to kind of circle back real quick to that idea where you were talking about Garnet Valley's approach to incorporating OER, building your e-courses. I think it's important to, to frame this for everybody. In Pennsylvania, we have 500 individual school districts <laughs> in the state. So that means there's 500 approaches to instruction across the Commonwealth. Um, but also in Pennsylvania, we have a very large cyber charter presence. What that means for our public school districts is that the money for students that attend cyber charters, it follows the student from the public school district to the cyber charter. So when we look at that infographic that that um, that Sam put in there that showed the costs associated with instructional materials and it went to building courses, that was really impactful for his district because they were also looking at the rising costs of enrollments into cyber charters across the Commonwealth since 2000, we have seen an over 200% increase in cyber charter tuition. That is an over 200% increase in the cost to school districts. That money again, leaves the district, goes to the cyber charter, but also the state then separately funds the cyber charters as well. So they're getting double funded. So that's a big burden on our public school districts. Sam's approach to what they've been doing in Garnet Valley has been helping to basically stop the bleed when it comes to funding. So what they're doing is saying, okay, how can we build out an in-house online learning program that might help to attract 
students to stay in house to take advantage of high quality online learning here, utilizing open educational resources so we can build a complementary instructional experience that aligns to what is being taught in person. So there is a severe shrinkage in what is that instructional gap that could present itself when a student leaves their in-person instructional, instructional experience, goes to another placement that is then completely different because they're using different instructional materials, have different teachers. They just have a complete breakdown in what happens at Garnet Valley as opposed to another cyber charter school. Instead, it's a seamless transition. The only thing we're worrying about now is becoming acclimated to an online learning environment. So a lot of really good things are happening with this approach. And then on top of that, we're learning about open educational resources. We're talking about personalization to students. We're talking about customization and flexibility. And then we add on AI. I mean, this is content development nirvana right here, right, Sam? I mean, I know that when we first met and we first started doing this, there, there was some hesitance. There was some resistance. The teachers, they were definitely thrown very quickly into the deep end of the pool, but they didn't just tread water. They learned how to swim with the best of them. And what has been coming out of Garnet Valley for years now has been absolutely exemplary. And we are constantly at the state level, constantly watching what's happening. Yeah, Becky, I, th I think I brushed over that point about the, the cyber schools. And, you know, I, I know there's a role for, for all, all things Pennsylvania, right? But we were losing at that time probably around a half a million dollars in cyber, cyber charter schools too. And, you know, when we, we looked around and we asked other schools what they were doing and they're like, Oh, we have our own, but they really didn't. They, they bought a canned digital curriculum and they mm -hmm. were farming out their teachers to, to cyber, you know, these, these online platforms. That's not having a cyber school in my opinion. So we started our own too. And I can say this, it was a disaster because I built it and I can say it was a disaster. It didn't, it didn't go well. <laughs> because we didn't know what we were doing. And it took us a long time to figure it out, right? Um, but where we are today is a much different place where any student in our district can be a cyber student tomorrow and they won't miss a beat curriculum wise. They have the same teacher, they have the same content, they have the same LMS, the same courses, the same resources. It's just a different learning format. And oh, by the way, three months from now, when you wanna go back, you go back into the brick and mortar and you don't miss a beat. Like that to us is the way education should be. We're now doing that K-12 for the first time. Last year was the first year we were able to do that K-12. And it has been, it has been amazing to see. And, and oh, by the way, we don't lose kids to cyber charter school anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely amazing. I think what Garnet Valley is doing at the district level and uh, what the Westmoreland Intermediate Unit does countywide with their e-academy program with building courses using open educational resources, aligning them to the district's curriculum. Those I think are the only two examples of that statewide. And that's truly it, unless there's another district doing it and they're just keeping it under the radar and not talking about it. That's it, everywhere else in, in the state is using a canned curriculum from a vendor and they're still seeing a space for online learning and, and trying to support online learning students, but nobody is taking it quite to this level where they're saying, let's prioritize open educational resources. Let's build that bridge between what's happening in person in our schools and what's happening for our online learners. And let's make that seamless transition the way that you are doing it. And then again, taking that next step forward and being the pioneers with utilizing artificial intelligence to make sure that you can be so responsive with your course development so that you can move it from, okay, well, we're going to prioritize secondary because it tends to be secondary students that go online. No, it's K to 12 now. I mean, that's moving faster than anyone else in the state, which is I'm mean, kudos to you. That is absolutely phenomenal. I really, truly don't think that anyone else in the state is doing it that quickly. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, credit to those districts who have tried, right? It it takes a lot of, of effort and people and time. And, 
you know, superintendents come and go and principals, you know, leave and teachers change. And it's really, really hard up until this point mm -hmm. now with AI helps streamline that process. We're, you know, we, we are super lucky at Garden Valley. Our superintendent is amazing. He's innovative. He's always thinking forward. Our board is very, very supportive. We have a parent community that believes in, in you know, future ready learning and, and those 21st century skills. So we have the perfect mix to get this off and running, right? The other districts that we help and support, they don't have that necessarily, but they're still making, they're still doing good work, but they were hitting, they were hitting those roadblocks with time and money and, and capacity. But AI has taken that lift off of their plates. Not, not yet, maybe, but I think in the, in the months to come, you know, you saw that it would, can drastically reduce the overall cost to, to do this. The efficiency, that was the biggest hurdle for us. We, we didn't have the capacity. Our teachers, I mentioned, they're teaching full time, right? I mean, they have yeah. 30 kids in their classroom and, and they have to, to, to work with those kids and answer parent emails and go to PD days and you know do all the things that teachers have to do in an eight hour day or 12 hour day. Writing curriculum and finding OER resources and creating OER resources just wasn't on their timetable. So we took a lot of that time off of their plates. And now we're starting to see that they're coming back and they're wanting to do this work because they see the value in it and they see it's possible to do it in that in that time frame that that's possible for them. And I think other districts will see the same thing in the in the weeks and months and years to come. Sam and, and Becky, thank you so much for laying out this uh, new uh, and most innovative leading district strategy that's having an impact already. Uh, maybe while we have you, there's a, maybe some questions from the audience. And I did see a question about licensing. Uh, is there anything you want to say about those tools? Thank you for showing free versions of, of those tools but anything related to OER and licensing the materials once you've created it that we should know about? Uh, Amy, we, um, we have a Creative Commons license that's, you know, um, non-commercial attribution, Garner Valley, share alike type thing. And we, we don't sell anything, obviously. Um, all, of our, all of our resources are, are free and open for anyone to, to use and remix and revise and use for their own purposes. Great. Is there any um, anyone that wants to jump in, whether it's in the chat or unmute yourself and talk to our friends here? I got a question for you. This is a great, <clears throat> wonderful presentation, Sam. I loved it. Um, so what's the process now for sharing throughout Pennsylvania all of these resources? Yeah, we don't have an official process, Dan. Um, and we're, we're open to collaborating with anyone. Like we wanna do this. We just, we were meeting with, we had um, um, Pat Mulroy, Dr. Mulroy and her team from World of Learning. That's another Western PA organization out of mm -hmm. IU8. They do a great work with um, world language courses. We had them in, in Garner Valley yesterday teaching us how we can make our process better with storyboarding our curriculum and creating more engagement and we're, we're just partnering with them and they're also you know pretty much an oer um enterprise so yep. reach out if, have my email i believe they're on the slides and we're open to collaborating because we know like this process for us works but i'm sure you know the schools or districts or, or your experience and background in education can make us better and we can learn from what you're doing absolutely I'll throw this comment out relative to that. I've recently been working with, I work out of the U.S. quite a bit lately. Um, the state of Bavaria, for instance, which is about the size of Pennsylvania, population-wise, has one technology system. And it's free to every, all, the, uh, all the districts in Bavaria. So I put that out there because just to put something in people's heads, there's a different way of doing things. We can share. Now, you know, Bavaria may have some its restrictions about other things, but you know, 
those 12 million people all share the same resources when it comes to education. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I would love it. I mean, at least Pennsylvania, we can't even agree on start times. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, well, we'll and see. Sam, don't forget too, in Pennsylvania, we have the PAIU hub on OER Commons too, and that's become a common sharing place for a lot of statewide initiatives that have been happening. So we now see our student-centered learning initiative happening there. The PA STEM toolkit is on there. So that's also a place where we can use to share some work right on OER Commons. Um, but a lot of times, again, because 500 school districts like to do things in 500 different ways, sometimes it's just a matter of finding out where people are sharing things and then making sure that we just know about them so that from an IU perspective, we can share all of that information out too. But it's great that you're talking to Pat Mulroy. She is an amazing colleague, somebody that I absolutely love working with. She tends to know a lot about what's going on in her region too. So keep talking to your IUs, keep talking to anyone in any state, your education service agencies, your ESAs, they are always your first line when it comes to what's going on in your state. Definitely reach out and ask them. They are always helpful. And if they don't know the answer, they know where to find it <laughs> or at least know somebody who will. So when it comes to sharing information, sharing resources, always ask and, and, we can find out ways to share if we don't have a way in place. So yeah, absolutely. Becky, do you have the slide with your, your contact info and Sam's contact info? Yes, let's go ahead info and put that up real because quick. Because I just want to also emphasize that Go Open is really a, a place and a method, a vehicle for sharing. We have the Go Open hub on OER Commons and all of OER Commons as a library for sharing. Uh, we uh, are really excited to be, you know, moving into a phase of work to look at other issues that that are affecting teachers and leaders in every state. And we we would love to hear from all of you any stories for your uh, challenges and successes to reach us, and we'd be happy happy to highlight you in our newsletter and our hub. And the hub is a place to find resources also about AI and OER. We have a folder that we're uh, creating a collection of resources about AI and OER. So if you know of anything to add there, you can add it yourself or let us know about it. We will make sure that the recording of this session is posted on the hub. We will send out an email to all of our members. It's going to be on our YouTube channel. The slides will be available for everyone as well so that you have all of our contact information, Sam's contact information as well. Thank you everyone so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, Becky and Sam. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks.